Hello doll friends, this is Michael Canadas with the Grovian Doll Museum. We're back. We have a little short intermission program for you. Um, this is new acquisitions of the Grovian Doll Museum. Um, this doll here may not be, you may be familiar with her, uh, particularly if you followed uh, uh, Rachel and mine and David's Australian adventure. This doll was used in, in I believe, one of the, the ads that we did for that. Um, I have to tell you, as a collector, this particular maker has all the power over me. If I see one, I have to have it. And this doll is an Alexandra de Hors, and it's really create it was created at the golden age of the French fashion doll. Circa 1868, very unique uh, head mechanism um, that created the, the, the movement. She's got a very nice movement. This is one of the earliest dolls with a patented moving neck. The Hire company had one, which was a little bit different than this one, but it's very unique. But I don't think that the movement is a special part of the doll. The special part of the doll is this incredible character face. And if you took each detail and separated it out, the eyes, the eyebrow, the nose, the mouth, none of them are that special. But when you put them all together, it creates an incredible effect. Um, this maker had, I, I believe, must have had an, an exclusive agreement with the shop Maison Guillard, which was the provider of toys to the imperial prince, the son of Napoleon III and Empress Eugenie. Um, and the reason I believe that is most of these dolls, when they do come on the marketplace, are in a dress of this pattern. And what's really amazing about this original costume, and this is totally original by the way, she stands 18 inches tall, but believe it or not, from front to back, we're probably at 28 inches. So this is the late 18, about 1868, 67. Dresses had never ever been larger. It would be on a, a living person about 14 yards of material to make this gown in full size. Oops. Um, pretty much uh, my, uh, our, our staff and I can, within a half an hour, make a pattern just out of paper of just about anything. I made a pattern of this dress and it took me a day and a half. Because if you look at the, the fall of this Grecian-esque um, design of the Greek key pattern to have everything line up perfectly um, it is a miracle and by the way most of the patterns that are out there on the marketplace of this um, this particular garment are copies of my pattern because I made one mistake in the pattern and I keep seeing it over and over again but I think we should go back to look at original clothes because this will be very interesting for people to see. And again, I, I wash my hands, so I'm not messing the fabric. But if you look, you see, they didn't line it. It wasn't that important to, to line it. When the fabric was new, it had a nice amount of stiffness to it, so there was no need to, to, to line it. Now, the problem with making this dress for uh, the modern-day customers you've got to find enough trim. This is a tremendous amount of trim. And another thing about the Dehors ladies is there's no one way to find the arms and bodies. There's many different bodies. There's leather bodies, wooden bodies. There are straight arms. There are generic type arms. This is the, the arm setup that I think is considered the most desirable is with the bent arm and the beautiful straight arm. As I said that, you know, I have no power when I see a Dehors doll, I have to have it. I think of this genre, they're, they're my favorite doll of all. 
uh, this, this particular type of a lady fashion doll. So she was a, is a really great um, uh, addition to the, the museum's collection. Uh, what's even more exciting about her is she has a wardrobe of clothes. Now, this is her best dress as far as condition-wise. Um, the other dresses need some curating, and we will get to them, and maybe at some point we'll do another uh, talk with what her other little goodies. She has one peignoir that the train is this long. It's just spectacular. And a fabulous green ensemble. And then don't forget to see her, look at her wig, because her wig is just really a masterpiece of um, hairstyling and just be in beautiful preservation. Now, when we open the Grovium, one of our frenemies, and we do have frenemies, said about us, we couldn't possibly open a, a museum because we don't have any bebes. Now, uh, what I thought was interesting is how did, it, how did they know what we had in our cupboards and drawers and whatnot. Um, and it is true that, that bebes were not the uh, main focus point of um, our collection. We collected other things, and there's many things that we would like to have, really like to have, but you know, there's only so much space, time, money. And really, it's the money's the problem. Uh, having enough money to have everything you want. But that comment, I call that fighting words, because if you tell me that I can't do something and I shouldn't do it, I'm going right after it. Um, so one of the things that we just added, and by the way, we do have plenty of babies, we added was this, this is a darling little tet jumeau. And it's from the late 1880s, not in the late 1880s into the, to the mid 90s. And this is an, an Ernestine jumeau costume. And look at, the, look at the embossed silk here. These are all kind of case, case book Ernest Jean Jumeau who ran the, the couture shop for the, the bebes. Wasn't at the factory, she ran a separate enterprise for the couture. And why I felt we needed this girl in our collection is we had labeled costumes. There's quite a few up in the case. They're labeled under the skirt, they're labeled in various places. By, but by this era in the Jumeau company, they realized that they needed to be right out there with their propaganda. So they put the armband with Bebe Jumeau. So when you saw this in a store, you knew it was a Bebe Jumeau. And if that weren't enough, if you forgot when the doll was sitting down, it had its Bebe Jumeau shoes. So it's really kind of wonderful. And of course, when I said, um, uh, you know, this has the Medell door mark from 1878, which those little marks are very helpful to have because it helps tell you that the, the, the prizes that they won, they would continue to change those um, numbers as they continue to win prizes. But this is really, what's special about this is not necessarily the doll, it's the clothes, that the clothes survived all these years, and if this were in perfect condition, you know, it's got wear of 130 years, if we're in per perfect condition, like it was new, it would be so bright, it would knock your eyes out. Time does something very nice where it just mellows the pieces. And please note the lace. This is um, a lace that Ernestine Jumeau used a lot. You might have a costume in your collection without the armband, but when you see all these components, I think they're very, very important to study. Um, and again, I was earlier talking about in one of our programs about using fabrics up and being careful. So if you notice with the slip on a couture dress, they built it into the skirt. So you don't have to waste material on the, the waistband. You just put it right in. And then here's something that's also really cute too. Up there you can see her bustle pad. So she has a little bustle pad. 
The bustle pad is, is very interesting. I was fiddling with it, and the stuffing in the um, bustle pad is actually Excelsior, the same material that they use to pack the dolls in. So it was a very um, inexpensive material to use for stuffing. And then if you also notice, she's got her little classic Jumeau earrings. Um, this is what you would see on um, a couture, couture dress doll. Now, value-wise, not, not that my program is about value, because if you see it, if you see one in this condition with this originality, you should buy it. When they were new, a doll dressed was like this would be twice or three times the price of just a doll in a chemise with nothing but a pair of shoes and socks. So they prized all the handwork. But I think it's very important to, to study um, how do we know if a doll is, has original clothes? Well, you know what, unless you're there, it's hard to know when it was dressed, it's hard to know. But you can look at things like this. The odds of getting either costume off of the doll or onto it, it's going to, at, at their age now, it's going to destroy the doll. With the lady, I will never remove her clothes because the arms are so tight that it would just disintegrate and it wouldn't be worth the risk. So in a lot of things with originality, it's really just basic common sense. So we're really happy to put these two new pieces into our collection for people to enjoy and people to study and and you know we're okay with people copying them, uh, copying the costumes. I think that just makes this hobby a whole lot more fun. So we're going to be back with the ultimate art doll. Bye bye.